thank you very much, David, for putting all this together. And also, again, thanks to Thomas. It was a wonderful way to start the afternoon. I'd like to introduce our three panelists for today. We've got three presentations ahead of us. Um, I'd like to introduce first um, Greg Tate, who's already up here. Um, Greg Tate is a writer and musician, currently living in Harlem. Since 2011, he's taught the history of Afrofuturism and black science fiction at Brown University. His forthcoming text, Flyboy 2, the Greg Tate Reader will be published in 2016 by Duke University Press. Secondly, I'd like to introduce Anthony Reed. Um, as of July this year, Anthony Reed will be Associate Professor of English and African American Studies at Yale University. His research and teaching cover the range of African American and African diaspora cultural production, especially literature, music, and film. He's published in journals such as Callaloo, African American Review, and Black Camera, and recently published a book with the John Hopkins University Press entitled Freedom Time, Poetics and Politics of Black Experimental Writing. He's currently work on a book that takes the recorded collaborations of poets and musicians as an occasion to consider the link between collaborative black art making and the broader politics of the black power era and the Cold War. And then I'd like to introduce William Seitz, a sociologist and faculty member at the University of Chicago's School of Social Service Administration. His research interests include community organization, American politics, social movements, racial inequality, and urban culture. His first book, Remaking New York, uh, published by University of Minnesota Press in 2013, examined the role of community activists and policymakers in the political economic transformation of New York City since 1970. His research on Sun Ra has been published in Urban Geography and the Journal of Urban History. And he's currently writing a book-length study of Sun Ra and Chicago's Southside musical culture in the 1940s and 50s. We've got three presentations ahead of us. We'll start with Dr. Reed um, and Dr. Seitz and conclude with Dr. Tate. Just so we have folks in the audience knowing we're going to do all the presentations, one followed by the other, then we'll have plenty of time for conversation and discussion afterwards, allowing us to bring things together and synthesize some of what we're hearing today. So, thank you. Um, is my mic on? Can you all hear me? Okay. I want to thank Dara for helping to get me here and to David Boykin for the invitation to think about the relevance of Sunrise Astro Black Mythology in conjunction with the current Black Lives Matter movement from Ferguson to Baltimore, from Chicago to Madison, from Detroit to Seattle and Los Angeles, from North Charleston to Cleveland and many other places. And I hope that that list of, list of places carries with it a little bit of shame that there are so many and I'm not naming all of them. Um, and I name those places rather than those taken from us for now because I want us to start thinking about the present splintering of space and time that we've been talking about, that disruption of our narratives of progress and fulfillment here on the other side of time. I'm going to begin with two epigraphs. The first is from Cedric Robinson, the historian, and the second is from Sun Ra himself from the film some of us watched last night. So one, and it's a long citation. The denial of history to African peoples took several took time, several hundreds of years, beginning with the emergence of Western Europeans from the shadow of Muslim domination and paternalism. It was also a process that was to transport the image of Africa across separate planes of dehumanization, latticed by the emerging modalities of Western culture. In England, at first gripped by a combative and often hysterical Christianity, compliments of the Crusades, the reconquests and the rise of Italian capitalism, medieval England, English devouts recorded dreams in which the devil appeared as a black moor, an Ethiop. This was part of the grammar of the church, the almost singular repository of knowledge in Europe. Centuries later, the satanic gave way to the representation of Africans as a different sort of beast, dumb, animal labor, the benighted recipient of the benefits of slavery. Thus, the Negro was conceived. Two, equation-wise, the thing to do is to consider time officially ended. We work on the other side of time. Ramesson describes the construction of a, of a myth, a repeated constellation of ideas that work together to construct and condition reality. In this case, setting the stage for the abstraction of black lives into bodies useful for labor and otherwise threatening to a sense of desirable futurity. Sun Ra seems to have anticipated, so Robinson's publishing in 83. Um, Sun Ra seems to have anticipated Robinson's arguments about the invention and social function of the Negro 
and, and set about imagining counter myths, alternative conceptions of black past and presence, alternative to valuing, uh, alternative valuing of black life. And part of the thing that I want to do, one of the questions I want to raise is for us to think about what it is to say that black life matters um, ag against and alongside saying black lives matter. Um, I'll repeat this and come back and say more about that throughout the course of this. His alternative imagining, I take it, again, if you happen to see the film Space is the Place, um, is what Sun Ra has in mind when he tells um, a character, you cannot take the black part of you with you, I'll take the black part with me, liberating that character from the mythic shadow that surrounds him and shapes mythic blackness. Thinking about the film in our context makes me ask about it in its own and diff uh, in its own context, and different things become plain to me. And I, I, I want to draw some of those out by asking us to consider, again, as I just said, the necessity of thinking black life, um, and especially of thinking black life within the current black freedom struggle. And I know that Sun Ra didn't like the term freedom, but I'm going to insist on it. Our black, f our black freedom struggle, like that of the 1970s, refers to, and thank you for making me feel bad having to say that sentence. I will forever feel bad having to draw that line. Uh, but our black freedom struggle refers to the still unfinished event of slavery and its narrowly legalistic end in emancipation, just as laws belatedly tried to complete the task of emancipation and legal segregation, but did not accomplish the task of rooting out the structures that supported them. Now as then, the point is not taking the place of the master, but eliminating the office of the master. Though the urgency often makes us think in terms of time, we must insist on freedom and justice now. Uh, I seek to follow Sun Ra in thinking freedom as spatial as well as a temporal practice, a practice that requires discipline, a practice that necessarily looks to both the past and the future, to the now that was, the now that is, and the now that will be. But it is also to consider blackness as a question of spatial and temporal scales. The proliferating, place, proliferating places we have where we have to come together to insist that black lives matter shows something about the ways that black lives give shape to the psychic geography of social relations. Let me begin with counting and not counting. For one thing, black lives matter, the phrase is meant, uh, excuse me, has to mean, one thing that it has to mean is that black lives count that black lives should not be disposable, that we collectively need to imagine the conditions of black livability, that we collectively need to reconfigure the myths of the future and geographic scales around, around which we shape our collective lives, that indeed we collectively need to reimagine re what it means to say we. Now, following the current protests, uprisings, and rebellions, there has been inevitable comparison to those protests of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, with different Martin Luther King citations being used, often recklessly, from riots to the voice of the unheard, to context-free pains, to nonviolence, in support of the idea that those people, the ones we saw stealing toilet paper from the CVS, are destroying their own community. To speak plainly, they are not destroying their own community. The truth, like the truth of that mother who was briefly championed in Baltimore for displaying the tough love something is absent, some think is absent from black communities, is unbearable. This, that is, they burn things down, they burn where they are because they do not have a community, but a place where they stay, drawing from the black vernacular. I stay in Florissant, on Albany, near Charles Street, Communities are or should be places where, black, where life, black life can thrive, can develop, can imagine its future, where people can imagine a return in their investments of love. That woman wasn't administering tough love as if loving a child that you know can be taken from you at the will of a state agent or one of its self-appointed agents isn't tough enough. What we see and what's harder to look at is a woman who has realized that there's nothing more she can do for him, no way she can love him enough to ensure that he'll just keep coming back. Re her realizing that his name, which she picked with such care and called throughout his life with such tenderness and exasperation, won't become a hashtag, his high school picture of mural. And we know black women are vulnerable to, uh, to the same sudden violent ends. We know the death of black fathers, uncles, sons, and cousins, and friends destroys families and puts extra unthinkable strains on us all. 
these are the times we live in. The protests of the previous generation were couched in the language often of liberal universalism because directed against overtly discriminatory practices. And in the film, I think Sun Ra, insofar as he was a co-writer of the film, Sun Ra is critiquing that already. A negative version of such universalism appears in the figure of uh, the overseer, a kind of cosmic pimp, who's for whom universal exploitation uh, is masked by earthly delights. But students of that era, that is, of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, will also remember that for King and others in speeches less cited, their target was, off, was also institutionalized joblessness, joblessness, structural impoverishment, the transformation of inner cities into ghettos and ghettos into open-air prisons through militarized police tactics. Likewise, we know that Sun Ra and others imagined a transformative aesthetic and epistemological program that would lead to black self-empowerment and self-definition. We have to be careful of the move in many accounts of the era to reduce the civil rights movement strictly to anti-segregation and then understand segregation in the kinds of uh, narrow terms that cannot include King's anti-housing discrimination protests or the creation of the ghetto as a direct result of public policy that imagined black life as a problem to be contained. In the present, black life is defined uh, against the false counting of statistics of black on black crime and thugs, two of the myths that shape the possibilities of black life. If, as Cedric Robinson taught us, the Negro is invented to justify the creation of the ghetto, and I'm telescoping some history, the Negro is first invented to justify slavery, and after slavery has become unviable to justify the creation of the ghetto, the thug serves to uh, justify continued policies and disinvestment that ensure the ghetto's perpetuation. Thug refers to the threat posed by black youths who will one day be full grown or old enough to recognize that their lives were not imagined in the imagined future whose metaphors and technologies Sun Ra so ingenious, ingeniously refashioned for his own purposes. The thug is the antagonist and the antonym of the citizen and the human. She or he is the one not intended in that phrase, all men are counted equal. The thug is usually but not exclusively black. Thuggery marks the outside of civil society, that against which civil society measures and understands itself, anarchy in the everyday sense of the term. Not surprisingly, Thug comes from the English colonial adventure in India, itself a project that depended upon remaking space, imagining a different spatial order and through that a different future from which the thug, which originally referred to persons who rob and murder travelers on the highways either by poison or the application of the quarter knife, uh, is excluded. Englishman Thomas Carlyle, this gets mapped onto other colonial spaces. Thomas Carlyle, famous for his claim that after slavery, black people wouldn't work because they were lazy and pumpkins rotted than the vine. He applied that to Glasgow, then an English colonial uh, mission. The American George Washington Cable, I think he was writing about Baltimore, complained that a few thugs terrorized the city with beating, stabbing, and shooting. While a Jay Burns, this is from the Oxford English Dictionary, Warned, that, uh, warned of some who even engaged knockers out, the, uh, who belabor and disable voters as they were entering the booths. They, the knockers out, are, are, are called election thugs. So that even the knockout game that people like to talk about from time to time uh, isn't new. That's at least 100 years old or somewhere thereabouts. These citations trace the transformation of the threat from colonial to domestic concern, but maintain the sense of the irrational, expected, but unpredictable threat that lies beyond civilization's borders. The thug interferes with the processes of empire and is the other of liberal democracy. Unresponsive to reason, preventative violence is the only response. And here, I hope it's clear that what I'm trying to do is to trace the kind of myth structure of the thug and how it is that legitimate protesters um, find themselves transmuted into thugs and for you to understand that when that happens, what you're being told is we can kill these people without regard. It's Hobbesian. Thomas Hobbes, um, I think, is the person that we have to turn back to, the famous 16th century apologist for monarchy, what he said in the part that's relevant, um, he served to explain th the anxiety that the thug engenders, engenders and why juries are more often, to s likely more often to side, to side with the killer rather than the killed, and I'm quoting him. 
to have done more to hurt a man than he can or is willing to expiate inclineth the doer to hate the sufferer. For he must expect revenge or forgiveness, both of which are hateful. Fear of oppression disposes, disposes the man to anticipate or to seek aid by society, for there is no other way by which a man can secure his life and liberty. Notice how that rhymes with Thomas Jefferson's notes in the state of Virginia, quoting Jefferson. Deep-rooted prejudices entertained by the whites, 10,000 recollections by the blacks of the injuries they have sustained, new provocations, the real distinctions which nature has made, and many other circumstances, I love that, will divide us into parties and produce convulsions which will probably never end but, the, but in the extermination of the one or the other race. They're about 200 years apart. They're making the same argument, the racial components of Hobbes's view are much more explicit when Jefferson gets to it. But notice how all of that rhymes with the Red Summer riots of 1919, many of which were really unprovoked white slaughter, or rather, white slaughter provoked by rumors of black uprising and self-extermination. Notice how those ideas rhyme and stay with us, and we hear them in so many instances where someone anticipates and takes black life, usually black. Then. Um, then the press prevails upon the family to encourage black people not to riot. The lesson is repetitive. Black people are not welcome in this country, but a certain ideal black person is necessary in order that the country can celebrate its myth of having reformed and extended equality to all. It's easy to see why people cling to respectability. If only you pull up your pants, speak English a certain way, hold yourself to the highest standards, maybe then it will be enough and we won't have it to keep keep having to hear the news of black children filling the jails and cemeteries. Unfortunately, that has never been enough. Recent history from Trayvon Martin and Jordan Davis to Renisha McBride, Rekia Boyd, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Ayanna Stanley Jones, and so many others show us that being a thug means being subject to violent death with the state being reluctant to act, especially when it is the agent of that death. The thug is presumed guilty, the one who murders the thug, uh, differently calibrated. Sorry, my pages are out of order. The one who murders the thug presumed innocent. The thug is beyond the reach of law. The law cannot protect the, pres uh, the presumed victim of the thug's violence. The law will not recognize a murdered thug as victim or a legitimate protester. The specter of the thug shapes black life and defines the forms it can take. You're counting black firsts, counting black CEOs, counting the wealth and the wealthy. It's easy to get confused by the spectacles of the black and successful, to see black millionaires and billionaires, to tick off the names Madam C.J. Walker, Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, Jay-Z, Beyonce, or Barack Obama, to recall the successful black business, businesses and business people and forget the concerted, deliberate, calculated destruction of black wealth. We count the exceptions which makes ordinary black life unexceptional. It's easy to count the number of black people on screen and to forget to look for those below the line who actually make the films. To count black faces on the bandstand and forget the ones who count the money. We count, th we count them and, we and they register as black lives, individual and the kinds of lives thought to matter. But let us not forget that black success as spectacle participates in the construction of the thug, the one who has done wrong, who can't do right, whose fate is his own. Let us not forget that the condition of their separation of the black successful person's separation from the general uncounted black life is often spatial relocation off the map of any lives. The more we count them, the more we accept the idea that other black lives do not count. This is the backdrop against which to think black life, formed and unformed, imminent, to follow Sun Ra in imagining the other side of time under different stars, an open-ended but differently calibrated freedom without guarantees, We'll see how they do, he says in the opening of the movie. Space is not the destination, but the location for a new beginning. This is the second part, and I'm uh, moving towards the conclusion. I mentioned at the beginning of these comments that my impulse is usually to consider Sun Ra in his own context, which is an important counter to those readings that take him out of any context or consider him only through the abstractness of astro-black mythology taken as a counter myth to those upon which the situ situation of blackness depends. By situation, I mean to underscore the spatial location of black people increasingly in cities, the place of blackness within larger social and political structures, and the sense of impending occurrence situation in the sense of something developing or about to happen. 
Sun Ra didn't, as far as I could, I've been able to tell, have much to say about urbanization per se. Um, but he did live through the era of black urban majorities and the election of black mayors in Cleveland, Carl Stokes in 68, and Gary, Richard Hatcher, Newark, Kenneth Gibson, Los Angeles, Tom Bradley, um, Atlanta, Mayor Jackson at West 74, Detroit, Coleman Young, 74, Chicago, Harold Washington, New York, David Dinkins, among others. Even Birmingham, his sub-native or alternative uh, city, elected Richard Arrington in 1979. Things were on the move. Parliament declared the Chocolate City a consolation prize for the 40 acres and a mule denied to the uh, emancipated enslaved. Sun Ra seemed skeptical. There is, on, there, is change in, there is a change in the air, he recited. It is the right road. They're going the wrong direction there. That's 74. It was as though the people and their leaders celebrated too quickly, rather in the vein of Drake's, we started from the bottom, now we're here. You asked me to think about the present, and for some reason that's the line that kept recurring to me as a problem to overcome. Where exactly? Now we're here, where are we? In that place where we count, but there's nowhere else to go. Urban policy turned to benign neglect, government infiltrated and undermined political organizations while ramping up the war on drugs and deindustrialization windled away the economic basis of those cities now under black legislative rule. In this way, it is imperative to think about space, excuse me, in this way the imperative to think about space seems to double as an imperative to consider where black people are, where and how their lives are shaped, and what their lives shape in turn. It is imperative to think, where are they going to go? When I wrote about the film Space of the Place before, I teased out an alternative conception of time suggested by Sun Ra's performance of blackness as performed to another characters, a kind of cosmic pimp character. The pimp, though meaningfully opposed to bourgeois codes of respectability, nonetheless belongs to a timeline of a planet on its way to destruction, as we just heard about. Sun Ra and his orchestra in this reading belong to a time latent within this one. Think of June Tyson singing of the black man sitting on his throne. Uh, and beyond the calculable limits of possibility, that is, after the end of the world. I want to close today by, with a little bit more attention to that phrase, the other side of time, which names both a when, I want to say, and a where. It transforms that phrase, the other side of town, in a moment when uh, more black people were starting to live on the right side of town. It names an obligation to work. We work on the other side of uh, time, which we are seeing from our young women and men. We have to think of Ron George Clinton, or at least critics do, but I want to think about Sun Ron and Curtis Mayfield and the way that both call for us to move on up and to still keep on pushing. Time officially ends, the, the, the phrase again is we have to consider time officially ended. Time officially ends upon the fulfillment of a particular vision or with the waning utility of a certain imagined future towards which time is imagined to flow. Black life has in this sense always been on the other side of time from some perspectives uncounted in the imagined destiny of the West. And I like that I'm gonna close by invoking another prison abolitionist, Ruth Wilson Gilmore who discussing the state of the anti-prison movement, um, which addresses the problem, which has always been the other side of black civic empowerment, tells us not only to fight to win, but to be prepared for victories, to ensure that we are ready the morning after the victory is won, to ensure that we remember backlash is not a reaction, but a tactic prepared well in advance. The cynical retorts of black lives matter, all lives matter, is as if focusing on black lives somehow mean, means ignoring other lives because um, focusing on all lives has historically meant not focusing on black lives in particular. Um, that cynical reformulation counts as the sign of a victory. No, it's not the kind of victory that undoes years of structural racism, which Gilmore helpfully describes as the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group di differentiated vulnerability to premature death. But this victory has made the shape of the racist edifice discernible through the fogs of false universalism that counts exceptional black people and ignores the many thousands of father and motherless black children and childless black parents the state produces through outright killing or the slow death of incarceration and disenfranchisement. 
like Sun Ra in the wake of the successful campaigns to have representative government in majority black cities, we find ourselves on the other side of time. Unlike then, we do not have a myth of collective exodus. We do not have the idea that we're just gonna all uproot and go under different stars. Now, we're here. Astro Black then is one name for imagining this moment on the other side of time where the sustaining myths that have governed and shaped black lives are starting to break down and what is usually covered over by the myths of the ruling order comes visible. It's a vulnerable moment, but despite its fragility, it still represents an opportunity to retell the stories of who we are, how we got here, what futures we want to claim, what worlds we want to build under which stars, and what more we want to ask of each other. Thank you. just as you are. Which one? Okay, cool. cool. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for that. And I, I want to thank everybody on the panel. It's an honor to, uh, to be with these folks. I want to thank David Boykin for leading this and, and thank all of you for, for coming today. The, um, the first part of the title of my talk the hoods are always false, it is taken from a broadsheet, essentially a self-published text from early 1950s Chicago that is called The Light is G. One passage in it goes like this. The hoods are always false, never true hoods, but always falsehoods. The passage goes on to play with the word hoods, including phrases like those hoods from the white race and how the brotherhood of man is a false hood. What I'm going to talk about today comes out of a, uh, a larger book project that I'm working on that focuses mostly on Sun Ra in Chicago. Uh, it's a particularly interesting and formative period for him, uh, but also for the city and for the South Side community as well. While my project is anchored in an urban historical approach, I'm also bringing to it interests that come from several other directions. One is that as somebody who teaches at a social work school, and has written on community organizing and social movements, I've always been interested in certain kinds of cultural activism that don't fit very neatly into the categories and historical traditions that academics like myself uh, construct. From another direction, I've also been interested for a long time in critical theories of utopia, particularly those by scholars like Ernst Bloch, Paul Gilroy, that focus on music and utopian culture. In this realm, I'm especially interested in the relationship between critique on the one hand and the utopian imagination on the other. Often these two capacities are, are opposed to one another. Some people are critics, it is said, while others are dreamers. And both are often seen as separate from any practical activism in the real, the real world. In reality, the separation of critical and utopian sensibilities can be seriously misguided. The black radical imagination, as, historical, as historian Robin Kelly terms it, offers a remarkably rich source of what I would call critical utopianism, a mode of engaged rejection of the world as it is that gains traction from the belief that another world is not only possible, but already imaginable. What is particularly distinctive about black critical utopianism, in fact, is how a deeply critical engagement with the present becomes linked to a drive to radically remake both the past and the future. By the end of the 1950s, this intertwined ambition emerges so effectively in the music of Sun Ra and the orchestra, where a focus on both ancient Africa and outer space comes together in music that in stylistic terms looks both forward and back, and that begins to take listeners and audiences on a journey to other worlds. It also comes together because Ra and Alton Abraham, his friend and business partner, worked to create or improvise a certain community infrastructure that enabled them to assemble musicians, 
find rehearsal space, play local venues, and produce their own records. This moment of fruition for the orchestra was the result of a long and complicated process of development, one that for Sun Ra himself begins, at least on Earth, as far back as Birmingham, Alabama, but it's also the product of a particular intellectual and cultural context in early post-World War II Chicago. An especially important moment of contribution to this music and this vision is to be found in the research and writing that Sun Ra and several colleagues engaged in during the early 1950s. And it is these writings that I want to focus on. These so-called polemical broadsheets, one of which I quoted at the top, consist of roughly 45 type sheets, several pages each. The originals of these are preserved nearby here at the University of Chicago Special Collections. Uh, there's a number of them that have also been reproduced in a volume that John Corbett has edited uh, called The Wisdom of Sun Ra. We do not know exactly who wrote these texts or which of these texts. What we do know is that Sonny Blunt, as he was most often called then, along with Alton Abraham, were at the center of a study group that also included James Bryant and Lawrence Allen, and that called itself Tamai Research. Some of the type sheets they produced were distributed to musicians. John Coltrane, for example, was given one by Sonny. And they were also distributed in Washington Park and on street corners. We also know that it was roughly at the same time, uh, exactly in 1952, that Sonny Blunt went down to the Circuit Court of Cook County and changed his name to the Sonia Ra, generally using Sun Ra as his public or stage name thereafter. What's especially interesting to me, however, is that these broadsheets are different in certain ways from how we typically read or hear the later forms of cultural production associated with Sun Ra, such as his music uh, in Chicago of the later 1950s. The broadsheets are harsh, they're angry, and they're religious commentaries. They're catechistic or sermonizing texts that are addressed to black readers or audiences who are well acquainted with biblical disputation. Often written in all capital letters with a liberal, a liberal use of exclamation points, they have an emphatic and urgent tone, and they may, have been, they may have been read aloud in public settings. Their key thematic threads knit together an amalgam of unorthodox religious beliefs, Afrocentric mythology, radical nationalism, and popular folk wisdom, using biblical commentary and bitter, mocking wordplay to awaken readers or audiences to what the authors see as the catastrophically degraded condition of black America. As such, the broadsheets also provide a window into some very strong street-level political and religious currents that were shaping the intracommunal dialogues taking place in early post-war black Chicago. It's impossible to convey how rich and complex and elusive the broadsheets are in a very limited amount of time. So I just want quickly to focus on several quotes and themes to give you some suggestion of how interesting these texts are. One major theme is that true knowledge has been hidden, that much of what you think you know is simply a deception, and therefore that black people's own fundamental beliefs are also often entirely misguided, a point that's conveyed repeatedly through a radical biblical hermeneutics. A quick sampling. The Bible was not written for Negroes. The Bible has been preached to every nation except the American Negro. Every nation on earth has had the Bible translated according to their own way of talking, except the American Negro. The Bible is written in such a way that it has one meaning for the Negro and another for the white man. Negroes do not know the Bible. How can anyone know the meaning of the Bible who place all their hopes in the Bible and scripture? Negroes are worshiping a God that has not saved them according to the salvation that the white man has enjoyed as ruler of the whole earth. A God of power could have saved the Negro long ago, but Negroes are worshiping a God that will not save them. As it is written, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, if Jesus does not change, then the Negro will never be free as long as he wants a God of that kind. A second theme is a harsh dismissal of the conventional forms of communal striving and self-assertion in post-war black metropolis, and an emphasis, emphasis instead on the enormity of the crisis of the moment. Question, and there's a sort of catechistic structure to some of these broadsheets which you see here. Question, does the Bible contain anything about the Negro? Answer, yes. Jesus said, let the Negro bury the Negro. 
Unfortunately for the Negro, the word Negro means dead body. The cemetery itself is named after the word Negro, necropolis, or city of the dead. If you like death and like being one of the living dead, then call yourself a Negro and continue to be rejected by the world as first class citizens. Here, the respectable term Negro is associated in the quasi-biblical etymology of these writings, not with race pride, but with racial death, and even with the subaltern life after death. This same broadsheet later situates an understanding of African-American crisis in the larger geopolitical moment. Question, is the white race going to be destroyed by God? Answer, no. Instead, they are going to be sent a teacher to teach them the real truth, and if they reject him, he will be sent to Russia, and Russia will then become the center of the new world. Perhaps a po uh, Paul Robeson reference here. Uh, either way, the authors of the broadsheets are clearly willing to reject the US-centric position in the Cold War framework, but they also give America one more chance to enlighten itself and thereby save itself. Another recurrent theme in the broadsheets is that it's not simply white people or America who are to blame for the crisis, though they are to blame. African Americans also have been betrayed by their own leaders. The first thing Negroes must do is to be able to tell a friend from an enemy. Some of the worst enemies of the progress of the Negro race are Negroes who are in high positions, who are doing nothing to better the condition of the Negro race, and are placing all the blame for the unfortunate condition of the Negro upon white people. Neither the NAACP or the Negro Church has done anything to teach the Negro an appreciation of beauty, and all the equality in the world is a lie if the people are ignorant. If the Negroes of America insist on an organization which advances Negroes only, then the white people of America has a perfect right to insist on an organization which advances white people only. After all, the name of the NAACP is National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. It does not mention white people who need advancement just as much as Negroes. Let me step away from the quotes for a minute and talk about context. There are a variety of relevant historical contexts in which one can situate the broadsheets to help understand them. One is that they attempt to respond to mid 20th century racial conditions with a sort of counter enlightenment theology, a political theology. There's a certain type of quote unquote antinomian religious heterodoxy that has a long history. Antinomian means against the moral law and historian E.P. Thompson sees this religious sensibility in, for example, early English romanticists like the poet William Blake, who rejected the moral law of official Christianity and the early modern capitalism of his day. Obviously, within African-American religious traditions, the importance of biblical hermeneutics and exegesis as the basis for Ethiopianism and other emancipatory political projects was fundamental throughout the 19th century. The broadsheets also draw on texts from other modern global religious philosophies, such as theosophical works, a number of which were owned by Alton Abraham. But, and this is the approach I wish to emphasize, I see these broadsheets as also very rooted in the particular political and religious culture of the early post-war South Side. This was, uh, as many people I'm sure in the room know, uh, a segregated black urban world that was also a highly cosmopolitan crossroads for migrants and for popular religious and political thought. Historians and literary scholars have often understood this time and place by focusing on the quote unquote popular front interracialism of the Chicago Renaissance. This refers to the largely secular intellectuals like Richard Wright, Arna Bontemps, Jack Conroy, Margaret Burroughs, Gwendolyn Brooks, Horace Caton. Yet late 1940s racial and political repression splintered apart interracial alliances in Chicago and, and elsewhere, and encouraged many Renaissance intellectuals to leave the city. McCarthyite political attacks spurred local civil rights organizations to declare support for Cold War military aims, while new commercial media outlets such as Ebony and Jet emphasized middle class mass consumption and a market liberal vision of racial uplift. The ensuing vacuum in political and cultural leadership was filled in turn by quite different kinds of working class black radicalism. As South Side community organizations, heterodox religious sects, parks, street level commercial establishments like bookstores provided cultural spaces in which radical ideas emerged and flourished. The most prominent of these was Elijah Muhammad's Nation of Islam, of course, but there were also black Israelite groups, Ahmadi Islamists, Rosicrucians, remnants of the Moorish Science Temple, 
Garveyite political groups, and many others, including the peace movement of Ethiopia. We can see ideas from many of these groups' philosophies at play in the Tamai group broadsheets. Indeed, it is likely that all of these groups were interlocutors and competitors in important community debates that today have become largely invisible. Some of the critical commentary in these broadsheets, while coded, is in fact quite locally focused. The repeated invocation of one phrase, all nations are as nothing to God, would have been recognized as a critical allusion to Elder Lucy Smith's Pentecostal Church of all nations with its interracial denomination. Another phrase, Jesus is the light of the world, signals a, mock a mocking reference to Reverend Clarence Cobb's First Church of the Deliverance. Yet the broadsheets also borrow and intertwine themes from many different locally prominent religious philosophies. And one way to view the broadsheets is as a kind of polyculturalist bricolage, to use historian Jacob Dorman's term. In effect, a process of experimenting with different ways of reimagining the nature of black identity, the past, the current crisis, and the way forward. In the few minutes remaining, let me highlight two final themes in the uh, broadsheets. The first of these concerns the ways out of the crisis, which are not fully clear in the broadsheets, but seem to be twofold. One, there's a road that leads backward through Africa. The other leads forward in the, former, in the form of some kind of aesthetic transcendence. So for example, in the broadsheet called There Are Two Ethiopias, we encounter the following. The American Negro is of Asiatic, Judean, Ethiopian descent. The Eastern, excuse me, the Eastern Ethiopians of India migrated to Egypt, where they became known as great builders, and the wisest of men, Ethiopians of Africa. In fact, there are many different origin stories in the broadsheets. They are fascinating in their own right. But in some ways, the most interesting, and I think the most characteristic, characteristic of Sun Ra, is this doubling of Ethiopia. The African origins of the Negro are both asserted and complicated here. In effect, the first Ethiopia was in India, which is asserted to have been the true cradle of civilization. And by the way, note the name of Ra's composition, India, uh, from 1956, uh, which may or may not refer to this particular uh, reference. This resulting original entity, excuse me, this resulting original identity, the Asiatic Judean, Ethiopian, is already a kind of polycultural or diasporic one. So we have an origin story that brings together mythologies constructed from many religious texts and traditions, all creatively read and reassembled. If new origin stories provide one road forward, the broadsheets also allude in various places to another avenue, an aesthetic path. Here's one version of it in what seems to be uh, a direct response to the Nation of Islam's racialist cosmology. You have heard it said unto you that white people are going to be destroyed. But I say unto you that it is your duty to teach white people the meaning of love, and you can do this through propagating and sponsoring beauty. Precisely what this kind of teaching and aesthetic process might look like is not spelled out in the broadsheets. And in general, the broadsheets offer more critique than utopia, more crucifixion than redemption, to use the terms of the broadsheets themselves. But there's one moment where the text begins to introduce a new dimension. Quote, this is the last warning to America. We, as ambassador to this country, offer America wisdom and life if she will publicly admit her sins. We hereby identify America as the Nineveh of the Bible. We accuse America of crime upon crime against a people who have been her benefactors. So on the one hand, we, we, of course, we have a, a sort of fire and brimstone style threat of religious punishment repent or perish, directed toward America for its treatment of African Americans. America is Nineveh, the biblical city whose destruction by God for its evil ways was foretold by the Old Testament prophets. The phrase crime upon crime is interesting, perhaps picking up on the new post-World War II international norms and laws related to crimes against peoples and turning this back on America. Here, the text operates less like a sermon than an indictment or a demand for public truth, truth commissions. But most interesting to me is the declared subject position of the speaker in this quote, we as ambassador to this country. The use of the term ambassador is interesting at a time when the US State Department is sending black jazz musicians as ambassadors abroad to promote the American way of life. But of course, we in this quote are not from America. We are from somewhere else. 
It's the first written, uh, excuse me, it's the first written declaration, at least that I found, that not only positions Ra and his colleagues outside of America, but as an ambassador, a representative or emissary from somewhere else. That somewhere else remains as of yet unnamed, but it's not difficult to see this as a step on the path to outer space, which for Ra will eventually operate as what we might think of as a transcendent, excuse me, a transcendent subject position for purposes of critique of life on Earth, but also as a new world in its own right. In conclusion, by looking at the broadsheets with this kind of urban historical lens, we can see that Ra in early 1950s Chicago was not merely a musician, but a cultural activist, not simply an emerging leader, but also a member of an intellectual collective, and not simply an individual visionary, but someone who, along with his colleagues, was deeply anchored in a local community. This local embeddedness and the development of a certain kind of global critical consciousness from within the South Side would continue to shape his work with the orchestra as the decade continued. It would also play an important role, I would suggest, in the production of cultural tools, the writings and the music, the self-organization and the ideals that sought both to reject and to transcend the structures of oppression that too often define that community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil, and we're going to conclude with Greg Tate. Yes, I need to actually um, call up a slide, okay. slide presentation, yeah. Yes, on the yes on the um, flash drive. Yeah. How's everybody doing? All right, we're gonna pull this together for you. Yeah. So I'm I'm, I'm gonna engage in like three different sets of operations up here today. They're gonna be in the form of what I call show and tell. They're gonna be segmented, but they're gonna be related. Um, what I want to talk about, one of, one of the things I, I want to address is uh, something Thomas brought up in terms of Sun Ra's um, kind of fraught, tense relationship between freedom and discipline. You know, these were like very important um, aspects of his dialectic, you know, uh, particularly as a band leader. Um, and one of the things, you can, I'll let you. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so one of the things that, that Ra, All right, so my first encounter with Sun Ra, um, I actually got mugged by Sun Ra. It was in 1975. Um, it was at a very pimpish lounge um, in D.C. near Howard University called Ed Murphy's Supper Club. And that was the first time I saw the orchestra. And they put on what was, I mean, it was easily like a six-hour concert. I think there were a couple of breaks in there. But I remember yeah, me and my boy Z, we got there like about, I don't know, 10 p.m. And I think we left like the sun was coming up, you know. And the thing was at the end of the performance, this magnificent performance with, you know, dancing and recitation, music, you know, moved across the continuum of uh, the black aesthetic, um, you know, in visual and musical terms, um, was a sunrise march through the audience, you know. And what he did when he marched through the audience was like, he started yoking people around the neck like this. And he said, give me your death. Give me your death. You don't need it. Give me your death. You know, so that's when I first learned that, that discipline was, was very much involved with Sun Ra's notion of so-called free jazz, which Sun Ra considered to be an oxymoron. You know, but at the same time, if you listen to the body of Sun Ra's work, of course, you get these 20, 30, 40 minute performances where it seems like it's nothing but freedom going on. But then one of the things you find out as you start to investigate um, 
you know, some accounts from members of the band is that things that sounded random were actually very composed, right? Um, and, you know, we know that um, um, Sun Ra addressed, you know, Sun Ra had his own way of addressing free the land, the land question as it relates to black liberation. He put this band of about 20 cats in a house in Philadelphia that they lived in, uh, that members still live in, you know. So the thing with Sunrise, like you also have to address, um, you know, these various kinds of, you know, kind of kind of kind of dialectics or tensions between freedom and discipline, between the practical and the paradisical, between the utopic and then the life underground as well. All these things are constantly in flux. You know, he gave himself like that conceptual and that kind of material flexibility in terms of the way he operated. That's why if I think about, you know, this whole question of black resistance just strictly in terms of music industry or, you know, an industrialized pro approach to the production of one's music, then Sunrise is somebody who's very much addressing this whole question of creating a sustainable model of development, you know, within the liberation struggle, right? Because we can look, we can think about various organizations um, that were committed at one point in time to the sole question of uh, black liberation that uh, were not able to sustain themselves as the orchestra has done across, uh, at this point, I think we're talking about a, almost a 60 year time span. You know, so for somebody engaged as, uh, in uh, the, the, also the creation of an orchestra, I work with a band in New York called Burnt Sugar, the orchestra chamber, uh, we've been around since 99. So Sunrise is definitely one of our models of sustainable development within this whole question of the practice of black music. And um, um, one of the ways in which um, he influenced the way that we operate in the world is definitely around kind of managing this tension between freedom and discipline, you know. And the way we do it is through um, in our musical practice, we actually have adopted um, a, a method of musical production by a friend of ours, a guy named Butch Morris, right? Uh, Butch Morris created uh, a system he calls conduction. It's the system for conducting improvisation, for conducting large ensemble improvisation with 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 member orchestras. I mean, he did it with orchestras in, in, in Italy and, and other places. And, um, but these also, they're not just models of sustainable development, then they're also model, models for um, democratized uh, creativity and expression, you know what I mean? And dealing with that tension between how do you actually conduct what's so supposed to be a free space, you know? Well, the only way you can build an ark is by having willing bodies who want to get on board the ship and then want to follow the captain wherever the captain is going across the raging seas, right? So. What we're going to do right now is we're going to engage in some conduction. You know, I'm going to give you some of the principles, some of the foundations, some of the gestures of conduction. And you uh, will or will not decide to be willing bodies in the creation of an arc in this room at this moment. You know what I mean? Um, um, it's one of the things, one of Sunrise axioms, and it's very interesting in terms of this context, you know, this conversation about him and black resistance because Sun Ra, one of Sun Ra's favorite axioms, kind of self-instructive axioms was resist me, make me stronger. You know, so he was thinking about it like a bodybuilder. You know, he was actually thinking of being resisted by the opposition as an opportunity to build his, you know, to make his position stronger. You know, and that again is another invocation of, of, um, of using discipline to arrive at uh, um, liberation or emancipation. Right, so I have to put the mic down for this.
Come back in. Eva, 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 Um, so let's put let's, let's try we'll try a little something put some of these pieces together right okay so we'll start with the sustain So, let's see. <clears throat> yeah. That's okay. I'm coming. So some, some of the show, you, I guess you're not going to get today because <laughs> you're in the world of glitchology. But um, what I also wanted to do was um, I wanted to read from some fiction um, that um, speaks to the way that um, Sun Ra expanded our sense of interconnectivity between past, present, and future between various modalities of, of uh, black ex expressivity, um, the way in which he, um, as I would say of, of um, 
Sam Dulaney and Octavia Butler gave us very much um, uh, a notion of an embodied black futurism, right? Uh, a thing that is lived, a thing that you claim in the now, um, as much as you uh, may speculate upon what it mean, may mean to be black and human in the future. It's very much about creating that future where you stand. You know, that's what his address of the land question, I would say, in terms of this communal living piece, you know, because, and then again, you know, you had to think about, you know, these, the practical dimension of Sun Ra in terms of you got a 25 piece band that has to be fed, clothed, and housed across five decades. You know, that's being addressed in the creation of this futurism as well. Yeah, I'll just start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm just going to read uh, just fragments, really, from, from, from two different manuscripts. Um, one is called Altered Spades, uh, Fables of Race, Mutation, Wars, and Harlem. And the um, epigram, the epigraphs um, for the book come from uh, Zora Neale Hurston and uh, Jean Toomer. Uh, from the eyes of watching God. It was time to hear things and talk. These sitters had been tongueless, earless, eyeless conveniences all day long. Mules and other brutes had occupied their skins, but now the boss men were gone, so the skins felt powerful and human. They became the lords of sounds and other things. They passed nations through their mouths. They sat in judgment. Gene Toomer from Cain. You sit there like a great hound, great black hound spiked to an ivory pedestal. And all night long, I heard you murmuring that devilish word. They thought I didn't hear you, but I did, mumbling, feeding that ornery thing that's living on my insides. Father John, Father Satan, what, did, what does it mean to you? You're dead already, death. What does it mean to you? To you who died way back there in the 60s, what are you throwing it in my throat for? Darlin' Spinks, we need come clean as two black women who argue constantly about the womb for higher homegirls, black women of color for whom other black women disapprove, those of my mother, not a free mayor of Gotham's ilk, those who say those girls are out there, though the truth is they are in here, listen to things nobody else wants to, like those voices, all our transcorporeal generations, sisters wailing and orbiting the earth in search of an inviting hearth, a basket of fruit laid down in an out of the way corner or upon an altar, a promise of remembrance. In pushing them out of our busy lives, we knew we were hastening our own demise. Isn't this why we became homegirls to answer their calling, calling all black women, calling all black women, lettered and unlettered, titled and untitled, forbidden and unbidden, corseted and uncloseted, all kinds except your kind, Spinks. Sphinx, that freak of nature who listens only to her own calling, the one who could somehow levitate beyond the reach of those voices. Why do no entombed grandmothers ever come around clamoring for your soul, darling one? Perhaps since all you ever do is fight, night and day, they know to leave you alone and worry more about the rest of us who require the strength of numbers and superior technology. No matter how often you scrape out your wombs, you'll be fine, remain fertile. That being your nature, nature leaves you alone not at the mercy of those voices. But let me tell you something about those voices in here. They tell us a great and terrible army will be raised against us. They tell us that in that time of slaughter, our bellies shall automatically open and unleash our bill, bill <coughs> excuse me. They tell us that in that time of slaughter, our bellies shall automatically open and unleash our militant and vengeful progeny. And they will fly out of us with their swords and seraphim wings and fire licking tongues and obsidian tails. And they shall raise this world of hypocritical Christians, mocking Muslims, Gentiles, Jews, illegitimate Coptics, false worshipers of Kali, artificial Nubians, and clone Egyptians. You know of whom I speak. Love from Dakau, Babylonia. Darling Sphinx. We all got put on genocide alert today, some kind of renegade circus for the truthful, soulful, and soon to be multiplying fruitful. Cigarettes and woolly blunts burn down the nervous fingertips. Studying the smudges and burn marks, we've re re reinvented the lost ark of divination. How many angels can dance on the nubs of these pawed and spavined 
hands, all these shaking hands. There will be no rowdiness, rowdiness in the lunch hall today. No lost weekend cuddled up in the game hole with my idol, Bunny Primus. Nada, Mayor Gotham and of <laughs> Nada, free, Mayor of Gotham. The mother I thought was a cipher, a blank space in my life. She wants us all dead, my sisters and me, wiped from the face of human memory and reproduction. I remember the night she became mayor, quite vividly, actually. I remember watching her and her campaign manager kissing quite passionately on the lips from the other terrace balustrade. I could see them, but they couldn't see me. I made myself <coughs> the lookout posted while my father read the little ones to sleep in their bedroom far down the hall. I could have told him she was well practiced in the art of deceit, surveillance, and sabotage, that she had even trained me to believe she kept her eyes on me at all times, that I never went anywhere without believing her gaze was fixed on me from some secret cubbyhole sim somewhere inside the walls. Not until I became a womb and rebirthed myself for the revolution did I stop believing those eyes continued to scrutinize everything I did, where once there were those who considered the wombs a lunatic fringe of dubious and delusional females. Now there are teams of doctors gathering around the clock to ascertain how soon we might cesarean ourselves and give birth to sword swinging Coptic death angels who will bear the three sided faces of Marina, Romeo, and Mandela ain't free. At the end of the day, it matters less whether we will or we won't. What matters, what, mat what threatens the status quo is that we do believe we can. What they all refuse to understand is that the quantum black womb does not carry the seeds of a race. The quantum black womb does not carry on a culture. The quantum black womb is a dangerous idea. Dangerous ideas have a way of spreading themselves around like a pestilence. And if we don't have the science to do this monstrous thing we fantas fantasize about all the time, why be afraid of us? Because they know one day the will and the way shall come together. We believe the day is coming soon when we shall hack our, hack our babies out of our insides and they should be airborne and swinging sharp and steel in Coptic rebuke. I know they have begun to marshal forces against our idea of becoming reality. Tell them I said, bring it on. Tell Nada I said, bring it on. Come bring it, Nada. Come to Harlem. Experience the magic. Feel the thunder and the metallic and acidic rain. Love from Auschwitz, Babylonia. Yeah, I'll stop. got three very different traditions of generating these kinds of uh, philosophies to try to make sense of the world we find ourselves in collectively. But I wanted to ask uh, Greg Garner on that about, could, could you share anything you know with us about your knowledge of the, the orchestra inhabiting the city um, and that's on like, as a model for like collective living was there exchange or how did that, were there other kind of collectives operating in Philly at the time? Because it just struck me as, okay, the orchestra, everybody's living in a house, sharing this philosophy or building philosophy, practicing philosophy and move. And I was just wondering about the spaces that got about here from there. Um, yeah, I guess one, one thing I was gonna talk about, um, with relationship to Ra and um, um, many other the great black band leaders is that they were uh, um, they were dictators and emancipators, 
you know. Um, um, they all created their own, etho- you know, theology around their work. So that's James Brown, you know, I mean, that's Duke Ellington, you know, um, that's Maurice White, that's George Clinton, that's Ornette Coleman, you know, I mean, all of these people who actually created this space for these musicians, these creative artists, they actually have, have the freedom that was denied them in other kinds of spaces. Like, you know, Clinton used to tell people when they came into the band, um, um, all that stuff they told you not to play over here, play over there, play, start, start playing that right here, like right now, you know. And so that's how they built that vault, you know. Um, but, you know, in, in the case of Sun Ra, I mean, you know, yeah, there was a, there was a cultish aspect to it, you know what I mean? But um, it was, again, it was a case of people um, uh, accepting the coercion, you know, um, and the, um, um, the, uh, the rules of the house, you know. So there was a thing, you know, part of that freedom and discipline was a thing called Sun Ra Jail, <laughs> right? You know, where uh, grown men, um, would go sit in the closet because Sun Ra said, uh, you, you have violated one of the rules, you know. And, um, you know, so that might be, you know, you were caught with a woman outside of the house or you were caught smoking somewhere near the house or maybe in the house or taking a drink, you know. And so the rest of the band would be rehearsing for like eight hours and you would be sitting in Sun Ra jail, you know. But the thing was, I mean, you know, the, the, the dialectic of that is that he made that such um, uh, an attractive place to be, you know, in that house, <laughs> under that under that rule. That again, some of these guys stayed for you know 20, 30, 40 years. You know, um, there's a funny story. Pat Patrick, who, who played with the orchestra, orchestra, um, you know, he told a friend of mine. He said, uh, he said, I knew it was time for me to leave Sunrise when I when I wouldn't crawl for him. You know what I mean? So, you know, they were kind of very arcane, you know, methods of of, of punishment. That were, that were being set up at the time. But um, I think, it, you know, I mean, I think it was just unique to the way he felt he needed to sustain a vision, you know. So I don't, I don't even know you, that you can compare it to even, uh, even to some of these other folks that we're talking about because they were all very much working within the context of the music industry and all responsible for, for bringing in profits to that in- industry in the multi-millions. If we're talking about James Brown and Maurice White George Clinton. I mean, all people, you know, with in, with the in the case of those latter two, I mean, certainly um, people who benefited from uh, the, the the methodologies and the mythologies that, that that Sun Ra created. You know, I mean, the costuming that June Tyson and Sun Ra created as well. You know, um, but I mean, I think that that if you're talking about that period, I mean, clearly um, one of the I think I think in some ways kind of the under uh, archived aspects of our recent history in terms of struggle is kind of the the uh, the millennial kind of cultish aspect of black organization that began to emerge, you know, with the Black Arts Movement, with the Black Panthers, with the BLA, you know, um, you know, where you had these kind of these sects, you know, these kind of guerrilla sects, you know what I mean, that found their kind of complement um, in uh, these musical organizations that were starting to emerge at the time too, you know, the the band movement um, that we associate with the 70s, you know, where the side men kind of become the front men, you know. Um, you know, Sly and the Family Stone, Jimi Hendrix had a lot to do with initiating that, you know. Um, but there's this, you know, this kind of this free fall moment or this moment, uh, the critic Clyde Taylor, um, you know, he refers to the, the 60s and 70s as a time when he says, uh, he said, yeah, a lot of brothers were freelancing their imaginations, you know what I mean? So in that fallout, you know, kind of leaderless post-Malcolm, post-King moment, you know, it's kind of every person for themselves in terms of defining, you know, what the shape of a liberation struggle uh, should be. It's just Sun Ra, because he actually started thinking about these notions of, of initiating like a certain kind of self-sufficiency, you know, kind of 30, 40 years before the movement. I think that's why you find some these contradictions or these paradoxes in terms of the things he's saying about connecting to uh, a black movement at the same time feeling like, um, not even feeling, I mean, expressing this idea that black people need to give up the whole notion of death, you know what I mean, and the whole notion of emancipation on earth, because he said earth, 
you know, the only thing Earth actually produced was death. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, the, 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 you know, Sun Ra just had a very advanced notion, you know, and Thomas certainly addressed it in a very eloquent way about the, um, the way in which self-liberation and within this kind of disciplined freedom context, you know, becomes a way of uh, creating uh, a powerful opposition. There's a, there's a kind of son of Sun Ra that came out of, out of early hip hop graffiti, a guy named Ram LZ, you know, and um, Ram is, is kind of in that line of prophets that have come with, from within the culture that have articulated kind of a theory of liberation that's based in creative expression. So what we call graffiti, he calls iconoclast panzerism, right? You know, and so what he looks at graffiti is doing is like transforming actual language <coughs> of the oppressor into, um, into a, a, a war machine, you know what I mean? So, because he sees this, uh, this, this, this kind of opposition that exists between the powers that be and, you know, um, oppressed folks as being really, at this point, it's a matter of symbol versus symbol. You know what I mean? So you have to actually gain control of the symbols and, and kind of repurpose or re-engineer them, you know, in that way. Um, I'll just, just a quick uh, addition. I think your question's a really good one. Um, in terms of Chicago, I think it's interesting sort of historically that, you know, mus musicians position themselves in relation to Sun Ra in different ways. And clearly some guys w were, you know, part of the orchestra uh, for, for decades. Other folks played, played with them uh, in Chicago, but didn't really become permanent members. Uh, I find it interesting that there are some of the most important early founding members of the AACM, the Association mm -hmm. for the Advancement of Creative Musicians in Chicago, and, uh, which began in the early 1960s. Uh, you know, folks like Joseph Jarman and, and Muhal Richard Abrams, who, who described talking to Sun Ra all the time. I mean, they interact with him, with him all the time. They learn from him. Uh, they didn't want to join, right? They, they had a different relationship with him. You know, people ask Muhal, you know, what did you do with Sun Ra? We talked religion. We talked philosophy. We talked spirituality. We talked, you know, we talked. And so I think it's, you know, it, it complicates the position. And it also suggests also for the AACM, uh, for, 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 for many of these folks, it was very important to found a different kind of platform, a different kind of organization in which issues of, you know, democratic participation, mm -hmm. accountability, mm -hmm. these kinds of things mm -hmm. were, were foregrounded. I mean, they're right there in the in the Constitution. Oh, okay. Right. Um, I'm just interested. Uh, I don't know much about him. The only thing, Sun Ra, um, you may say conjures up to my mind is when he came to Chicago and I think I was in high school or, it, I mean, I graduated in 69, so I think it could have been before then, if I'm wrong, someone who was out there in Grant Park who remembered him with all those colorful clothes and these different kinds of hat styles and, I mean, uh, the young lady who, uh, who's uh, dressing like that now doesn't even come up to par to what he was dressing like. So um, could someone, maybe from the audience, if you guys are not Chicagoans, could you uh, explain, for instance, how did he even get invited here? And we don't hear, I realize he's gone, but I'm saying, or as I call it, he left. Uh, what, what influence, if any, uh, did he have on someone to even be invited during the Mayor Daley administration? Um, I count all those kind of things as outside influences and even people who they bring to, see I don't call it Millennium Park, that's Grant Park. They're taking everything that we have. So uh, just tell me a little bit about what you know. What does Sun Ra do to influence his, you know, being, literally to be, to bring him to Chicago? What year was that that he came to Chicago? For those who remember, in he Grant Park. First came in 1944 or something. Well, he, he migrated to Chicago in 1946. Yeah. But you're asking about some of the jazz festival performances in the 1980s. And I think it does encourage us to focus on some of the very real differences in ways that the band operated at different points yeah. in yeah. its yeah. career. Um, and I think <coughs> comparing it to some of the engagements that Ra had in the. 
Yeah, but I mean, yeah, the thing is, like, he he had he has a history in Chicago that pre predates that because he was here as a working musician from forty six to about forty six six, to sixty one. Yeah, sixty one. Yeah, you know, building the band, building a career for himself. So, you know, he had a deep, indelible history here. You know. <laughs> One thing that I would add to that is that Alton Abraham, his friend and business partner, stayed in Chicago after Sun Ra went to New York in 1961 and continued to be active in producing albums and other things. And so it's quite possible Alton was involved in bringing him back to Chicago. Thomas? themselves Sun Ra fans or Sun Ra collectors, there was a tremendous amount of ambivalence thrown towards Alton's way. Alton was seen as the, the business guy who you know, manipulated when releases were going to come out, um, had a, a, a very close relationship with Sun Ra, but maybe not quite such a good relationship with the band. And it seems like you've looked at Sun Ra and Alton very closely, and I'm wondering if you can talk more specifically about that. His son in the version of a measurable equation that, uh, that he put out, uh, says that Alton was basically responsible for Sun Ra's idea about himself, converting himself into this myth person. And I wonder if you could speak to that. Sure. Um, it, it's difficult to entangle a lot of this stuff, uh, even with the sort of archival materials that are available to us. Um, most of what we have here in Chicago, for example, at the University of Chicago Special Collections is uh, the materials that were uh, that were saved by uh, John Corbett from uh, Alton's house in Chicago, and uh, those materials include things like you know notes, financial records, uh, a lot of album release uh, kind of business correspondence. Um, there's also some amazing art. There's recordings. There's other things, um, some of which have been preserved and made available for you know for the public. Um, so I guess one one thing as an historian. One way to think about this is you're, you're getting what was left through Alton. And so in some ways, you know, you're getting a picture of Alton and you're getting a picture of Sun Ra through Alton. Um, at least that's the picture that I'm getting when I do, you know, my research. So I, I, I sort of, I'm not clear exactly, uh, you know, how to tease out this question. I, th I think what you're, what you're saying about uh, musicians' recollections and their own sense of ambivalence sometimes, the tense, the tense issues they might have had with Alton, uh, what, what does seem to emerge is that Alton was the guy who got a lot of the gigs when they were here in Chicago. Uh, Alton was a important participant along with his friend, uh, James Bryant, in the Tamai research that I talked about in my paper. Uh, Alton, uh, even predating, I think, his, his he, he, it's not clear exactly when he met Sun Ra, it was probably around 1951, 52. Alton himself was born in Chicago, uh, grew up here. Um, he was, uh, I would say, a fairly well-known guy in the community. He had brothers who were also fairly well-known in the community. Uh, one of them, one of his brothers, was elected mayor of Bronzeville in the late 1950s, which suggests he was well-known in the community. Um, I think Alton, by, by most accounts, Alton was, uh, uh, he shared a lot of su Sun Ra's uh, spiritual interests, his, um, his sense of, of a need to create a music that was, that was independent, that was autonomous. Uh, it, they themselves created El Saturn Records together, very much as an enterprise to not only uh, produce their own music, but also to create visual art, to create artifacts, and some of those are also still, still with us. Um, I, I don't, you know, it, there, there's an interesting story. I, I don't know why Alton didn't leave in 61 when Sun Ra left, and I don't know why Sun Ra left, and I still haven't even necessarily heard you know, a, a, a fully definitive account of why he left when he did. Uh, again, there's still confusion about when he came back. Um, so I think, in his, you know, as an historian, um, I've tried to situate the broadsheets in the kind of broader community milieu, understanding that Sun Ra and Alton were kind of at the center of that without knowing fully who all the other participants were, but suggesting on some level that, that this was not one man or two men by themselves isolated dreaming philosophically, but rather folks who were active in a community and who were engaging and discussing, proselytizing,
debating and learning from each other in public spaces like the park, in clubs, and in other kinds of sites on the south side. Yeah. But when, they, when they moved um, to New York in 61, they took up that long residency of slugs. That's right. That's what I, which I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a very propitious time given kind of the emergence of Cecil Taylors and Albert Islers and, you know, John Coltrane. I mean, the way in which that whole voice in the music was just becoming very dominant. We have time for about one more question. Um, good afternoon. Um, going back to uh, Professor Stanley's talk, um, he had mentioned uh, the concept of Afrofuturism, and he also identified Sun Ra as the last angel of history, and it immediately made me think of the uh, documentary uh, by John Confro, mm -hmm. um, which you were featured in, uh, Professor Tate. And he also um, he talks about Sun Ra in the context of uh, artists such as uh, George Clinton, and then uh, further goes along to talk about um, African Americans writing science fiction and then even talking about um, electronic artists such as Derek May and uh, Carl, um, Carl Craig. I'm um, curious to know uh, from any of the panelists and also uh, Professor Stanley as well is, um, you know, you know, who are some of, um, you know, some of the closest correspondences that you see, um, particularly among contemporary artists, um, contemporary writers, musicians, uh, that you see um, either um, in dialogue with um, Sun Ra's um, artistry and philosophy? Um. Well, yeah, I mean, self-consciously, I would definitely say uh, Janelle Monet, Wonderland Art Society, uh, Wangechi Mutu, certainly uh, people like Sanford Biggers uh, in terms of visual artists. Um, you know, and then, I mean, the thing, I mean, I think John's film is very important because I think it's still like the only survey we actually have of a continuum of people who work creatively in this kind of speculative, exploratory way with like new technology or with the ideas of kind of casting, um, you know, black communities, black bodies into, you know, kind of a, 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 a post-apocalyptic or utopic kind of kind of future, you know. So the thing is, you know, Octavia Butler is in that film as well, and you know, one of the things that certainly happened. Um, in the wake of her work is there's just this explosion of black women writing science fiction novels, like writing series of them. So, you know, I think of um, N.K. Jemsen and um, uh, uh, Nanette Okafor, o Okafor, you know. Um, um, oh, man, you know, I actually, I actually just put together like a real comprehensive list. But, I mean, it's, you know, it's about 12 or 13, you know, kind of, black women, you know, kind of with working within the field now, um, you know, who have series of books out, you know. So, I mean, there's been just been this real kind of explosion um, uh, since, you know, John did the film, you know, in 1995, I think, 94, 95. Well, you're talking about the fact that Sun Ra is the only person who has When you hear in their yeah. music right. the connection to Sun Ra, they sure talk a lot about Sun Ra, and I think that's a very positive thing to get people to investigate and explore Sun Ra's music. Right, and um, I'd also include what Nadler as well, because he incorporates um, a lot of vocal samples from his favorite synths to play in his music. He did that uh, the whole thing on tomorrow. <laughs> right, yeah. right, yeah. Shades of Tomorrow. Yeah. Can we have a round of applause for our panel, please? Thank you all. We're going to break now for coffee and tea, which is right out in the lobby. We ask that you come back and get settled by no later than 425 so we can launch, go right into our roundtable discussion. Thank you again. <laughs>